writings, they would have recognized even back then that that was incorrect. So after finding a few dozen statements like that, and what I really found most frequently was uh, placing historical events in the wrong geographical locations. And so I put the Quran aside. Eventually, I did get to the Bible. And when I told you earlier that I didn't meet Christians until I was 27 years of age, that was to get close enough to them to have a conversation. I did see two Christians from 40 feet away when I was 11 years old. And uh, they were two businessmen in dark suits that came into our public school. They placed two boxes on the teacher's desk and left without saying a word. But in those two boxes were Gideon Bibles. And each of us public school students picked up a Gideon Bible. I still pack around that Gideon Bible. I got it when I was 11 years of age. I didn't read it till I was 17. And maybe that was just as well because it's uh, Elizabethan English. <laughs> but in the Canadian school system, they saturate you with Shakespeare. So before I began to read this book, I had already studied and memorized portions of six of William Shakespeare's plays. And so this foreign language here didn't bother me at all. And I immediately recognized that this book was very different from any other holy book I had examined. Namely, that it was clear, it was direct, and very specific. I didn't have to search for things to be tested. Every single page I could find statements about science and history that I could put to the test. In fact, it took me three and a half hours just to get out of Genesis chapter 1. I found over 30 statements in that chapter that could be tested against the established record of nature. By the time I finished that three and a half hour look at that first page, I realized that we had in Genesis 1 were 11 events of creation and three initial conditions, all correctly stated and all in the correct chronological sequence. I was also impressed that Genesis 1 followed the scientific method, you know, making no attempt at describing the sequence of events until a frame of reference was first identified and secondly, the initial conditions. Now, 10 years later, I realized I shouldn't have been so impressed. Uh, the scientific method came from the Bible, so of course the Bible follows the scientific method. Now, Thomas Torrance, a Scottish theologian, documents that quite well. Uh, the birth of the scientific method came from a Christian context. <laughs> now, whenever the Bible describes a sequence of physical events, it follows that pattern. Well, before I had read the Bible's creation account, I had been exposed through my readings as a child to about 100 different creation stories and myths in the different religions of the world. And so I had an opportunity in that three and a half hours to compare the Bible score against second place. The second best creation account with respect to the established record of nature is the Enuma Elish of the Babylonians. It mentions 13 events of creation, and it gets two out of 13 right. The Bible mentions 11 and scores 11 for 11 and 3 for 3 on the initial conditions. And I close the evening out by doing a back-of-an-envelope calculation on the odds that the author of this text, without God's help, could have put it all in the correct chronological sequence if he'd been given the events in random order less than one chance in six billion. But of course, the most amazing thing is that each of these 14 items was correctly described. And so I realized that this book deserved a more definitive test than these other holy books I've been reading. And I made a commitment that night that I would spend a minimum of one hour a day uh, checking the Bible out until I found a provable error or contradiction. Now, I naively thought that I would probably be done in about a month, five weeks at the most. Eighteen months later, I finally made it to Revelation 22. That's because I skipped a lot of sections. <laughs> and it wasn't one hour a day. It was more like two hours a day. And there were thousands of things that I had a chance to check out with respect to science and history. And at the end of that 18-month period, I realized that I had been unsuccessful in finding a single provable error or contradiction. <coughs> now, I'll admit to you this. I found portions of the Bible I didn't understand and therefore couldn't test. 
But that didn't bother me because that's also true of astrophysics. There's large sections of the universe that even today with all of our instruments, we can't comprehend. Likewise, I found problems in the Bible that I couldn't solve. But I said that's no different than the record of nature. There are problems in astrophysics that we can't solve. And yet I've, I cannot, I've yet to meet an astronomer, even an atheist astronomer, who's not committed to the belief that the more we learn about the universe, the more truth we'll find and the more consistency we'll find. And so I realized that's exactly what I was finding in this book. Moreover, during that 18-month period, I found problems I couldn't solve at the beginning that I could solve at the end because of the march of science. And so that gave me confidence that indeed the more we learn, the more consistency uh, we'll discover, the more verification uh, we will find. However, the university where I was now attending, uh, the University of British Columbia, had a reputation for mocking people who believed in God. And so I felt that before I could go public uh, with my discovery about this book, the Bible, I had to prepare a stronger case. And so I went through the Bible a second time, and kind of like what I did with Genesis 1, I found portions where I could calculate the probability that this was of human origin versus divine origin. In fact, if you're interested, I've condensed this to a single page, and I don't have copies with me, but you're welcome to write us, and we'll be happy to send them to you at no charge. Uh, but statements like in the book of Job concerning which star clusters are bound and which ones aren't, statements about the properties of blood and uh, statements about gravity, etc. I began to collect these things and calculate the possibilities. I also did the same thing with history. And uh, this too is available if you'd uh, like to get it. Uh, what I discovered was that all of these holy books try to establish their supernaturality by predicting the future. But the Bible does it far more frequently than other, any other holy book. Whereas second place, which would be the Mormon scriptures, predicts the future 50 times, the Bible predicts the future 3,500 times. And whereas the Mormon scriptures get a record of 40% right and 60% wrong, the Bible gets a record of 100% right. 3,000 predictions have been fulfilled. And unlike these other holy books, the Bible is far more specific actually giving names, dates, and places. And what impressed me most of all was the Bible predicting people by name before they're born. I said, you know, that's really gutsy. To predict somebody by name 300 years before he is born and say exactly what he will do and when he will do it and where he will do it and have it all come true exactly as predicted. Even events that have been fulfilled in our lifetime where you obviously can't say, well, maybe the Bible was written later than what people claim. Obviously, the Bible was written hundreds, if not thousands, of years ago. But what I've done in this little handout that you can pick up is to take 13 predictions of the Bible where it's easy to calculate the probability. And, um, for example, all the predictions in the Bible about this future King Cyrus, the odds that everything that Isaiah said about this future King Cyrus, you can calculate has less than one chance in 10 trillion of happening coincidentally. Well, you add up 12 more such predictions, and the bottom line is there's less than one chance in 10 to the 138 that all 13 of these predictions would come true coincidentally. Now, I looked at those 138 zeros. I said this is better than our confirmation of the second law of thermodynamics. As a physicist in the audience can tell you, there's about one chance in 10 to the 80th that you can get heat flowing from uh, cold bodies to hot